Good afternoon. We will start the session on keynote lecture on executive summary and outlook to Sao Paulo. My name is Eduardo Krieger. I am the immediate, immediate past president of the Brazilian Academy of Science and also from the Medical School of the University of Sao Paulo. So it's my great pleasure to be here with the help of Richard Orton that will moderate the session. We believe we will have a nice discussion. And for us in Sao Paulo, it will be a great honor to organize this meeting, the regional meeting next year. Our Dean, Professor Auler, will give details on the organization. And also we have Jarbas Barbosa, that is the second man in the Ministry of Health that will also welcome you to, to Brazil. And of course, it's not easy to organize a regional meeting in Brazil after all the success of Berlin, fifth year here, as you know, Professor Gunting is expert in organization of this meeting, and I believe all you agree that this every year is more and more success, this idea to put together several actors trying to really discuss what's important for health in population, health in the world. So it's our responsibility to discuss and also to implement what we discuss here. But anyhow, it's not easy for us to make this in Brazil, and especially because we had a regional meeting this year in Singapore, organized by John Wong, and this is very hard to match the success of uh, Singapore. But as a poet in Brazil says, what we lack in competence we will compensate in dedication and hard work. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, that is Jarbas Barbosa da Silva. He is Secretary of Health or Survival of Minister of Health of Brazil. Please, Professor Jarbas. Professor Krieger, Mr. Richard Orton, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's an honor for the Ministry of Health of Brazil and for me personally to be part of this 50 World Health Summit, sharing discussions, symposia, keynote speeches, and working sessions with academics, representatives of civil society organizations, corporate executives, and government officials all of which are participants in the policy-making process within nations and key stakeholders to define the global agenda for health. This is a crucial moment for the world to reflect over the importance of promoting the people's health and well-being, recognizing health as a priority in the allocation of resources. During the past three days, the international community has come together to discuss extremely important issues such as the coordination mechanism in foreign policies to ensure a common strategic approach on matters of global health, stressing that political and trade interests must, must be socially conscious and fair and ought to support the achievement of the development goals. Also, the value of innovation for better health and more wealth was brought to light, stating that intersectoral cooperation and exchange of knowledge and expertise through research development are vital to improving high-quality patient care and have positive impacts on economic growth and sustainable development. Research for Health was reaffirmed as a joint responsibility of both the public and private sectors of academia and the industry, encouraged and supported by governments. Research in Health was additionally pointed pointed out as a key element in overcome the difficulties of implementing universal health coverage. Understanding health as a fundamental right, regardless of social or financial status, 
Presenters recognize that full access to high quality services for prevention, treatment, and financial risk protection can only be guaranteed by using evidence-based solutions, well-trained health workforce, efficient resource allocation, effective services, governance, and accountability. In times of economic difficulties, for instance, cost-effective interventions are fundamental in order to assure the well-functioning of health systems. This symposium also draw attention to the fact that our societies are demanding more efficient and equitable public health services. Social media has proven itself a powerful mechanism for organizing like-minded groups, particularly the youth, with a view to claiming basic rights and demonstrating social concerns. Health authorities should learn how to use these vehicles, seeking to increase social participation and accountability, as well as to respond to the needs of the youth for more equitable health policies, such as prevention of non-communicable diseases, including tobacco use, obesity, inactivity, sexually transmitted infections, and HIV-AIDS. Furthermore, the summit addressed the challenges towards health promotion within the post-2015 Global Development Framework. Many speakers called upon the international community to maintain the unfinished agenda, such as infant and maternal mortality, and to expand the health-related goals in order to include vaccination coverage and priority to non-communicable diseases. Health is at the same time cause and consequence of development, and it needs to be in a central position in the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals. The establishment of precise indicators to assess progress in universal health coverage was also considered imperative. All of these global discussions and their outcomes reflect directly on our regional agendas. In the Americas, for, for instance, countries have gathered in regional and sub-regional forums to face collectively the most important health challenges of the continent. Latin America and the Caribbean are very inactable, social inactable regions, and it is fully recognized the role of universal health coverage to promote equity and the benefit to ensure coordination and synergistic interaction between the health sector and the cash transfer programs and other social interventions aiming to overcome extreme poverty in better health outcomes. Sound evidence has been shown recently on this matter, and these lessons can be shared with other developing countries, supporting their efforts to build a comprehensive health system based on primary health care. Disparities regarding universal coverage call for a clear definition that may lead us to establishment of measurable objectives and eff effective results. Moreover, it is imperative that the health sector strengthen its capacity to lead intersectoral strategies to face the social determinants involved in such a diversity of challenges we face currently like neglected tropical diseases, non-communicable diseases, and the high burden of injuries and violence, for instance. Brazil, Brazil and other Latin American countries also acknowledge the strategic importance of human resources for health for the achievement of the goal of universal health coverage grounded in the development of a health system based on primary health care. Therefore, they are committed to identify, monitor, and report on specific health professional shortages, particularly in vulnerable populations, and at the first, first level of care as a basis for the implementation of special programs and intervention to address such shortages. The Americas have developed a clear leadership in the global scenario under the coordination of PAHO, AMRO, WHO, in the implementation of comprehensive immunization programs. And they have had impressive outcomes on elimination and dramatic reduction in the burden of immunopreventable diseases. The world is now facing the challenge to eliminate polio and to ensure the universal access to one of the most effective interventions in public health, that are the vaccines. Partnerships between public and private sectors and mechanisms such as the revolving fund for vaccines in the Americas and the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations globally have obtained tremendous success, increasing the affordability and the access to vaccines worldwide. 
Finally, strengthening the health system is clearly a shared responsibility for public and private sector, academia, civil society, and international organizations. This is the way to respond to the current and future challenges. Our countries need to face all the complexity presented in the current health situation of our population. For instance, the double burden of neglected tropical diseases and non-communicable diseases on the poor, the demographic transition, migration, social determinants, proper and sustainable budget for health system, accountability, social participation, assurance that the effective interventions are being adopted among many, many others. Besides their own national efforts and bilateral and multilateral cooperation, the Ministry of Health are full aware of the importance of WHO leadership and its role as an organization providing coordination and technical cooperation in an effective, efficient, responsive, transparent, and accountable way. These important issues presented in the current global scenario were openly and deeply discussed during the, this summit, highlighting the importance of this unique high-level forum and the contribution that it has provided to move forward the global health agenda. I'm sure the World Health Summit Regional Meeting to be held in São Paulo, Brazil, in April 2014, will bring all countries in our region to the same inspiring movement. And we will be very pleased to have all of you sharing with us your knowledge, expertise, and commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jarbas. And I will ask Richard Horton to take over. Thank you very much. And we're going to have plenty of time for discussion this afternoon. Um, but first, we're going to have our spiritual leader of the World Health Summit, uh, Detlev Ganton, who's chair of the board of the Charité Foundation and the founding president of this summit. Do what has become a tradition now uh, at the end of the meeting, and that is to give us a summary, uh, an executive summary of what has taken place at this meeting, indeed what this meeting stands for. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Ganton. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, World Health Summit uh, is not coming yet to an end, but it's uh, the last day. And uh, at the opening ceremony, we were asking, uh, what will be the results? Having two days, two days and a half of, of meetings is wonderful. Uh, fruitful discussions will be stimulating and we come uh, back home and stimulated for new work. Uh, personal interactions is important. New partners and new friends in our research and activities are important, but what can the summit itself do? The M8 Alliance and uh, John Wong is the outgoing president and uh, Jose <coughs> Aula is the incoming president. Uh, we feel with that we have to come to some conclusions how we can improve the state of health in the world. Now, this is very difficult to measure, as you know, and uh, there are no single measures which uh, will improve the health uh, worldwide uh, within a um, measurable time. There's one statement, so I'm, and we are not kind of presenting a paper which will be voted upon by you as an assembly. Uh, but it will be a paper which we feel is an important result of the discussions which we have had so far. And one is, and I'm citing the uh, kind of the quote which John and I pronounced in the very beginning, and I cite, scientific progress is enormous, but it does not reach the people who need it the most. The burden of diseases is even getting greater in many regions of the world. This is not acceptable, it is not tolerable. We want to take our own responsibility. And I hope we join, you join us in taking up responsibility wherever you are and where you are working. We also feel <clears throat> that health should be used as a Trojan horse 
and that was an expression somebody coined at this meeting, in order to effectively engage other sectors and jointly build adequate institutional arrangements supported by academia, politics, health economy, and civil society who were all represented at this meeting. And of course, considerations of universal, universal, universality, equity, and justice lie at the very core of any approach towards health and health promotion. And there were four major points at the meeting, actually the, the, the tracks of the uh, program structure, which we followed in making the following recommendations. The first is education and leadership. Education, education is the best vaccination. And uh, you have seen, and uh, I'm very happy to see now, there are lots of young people in the audience. And of course, as we need to mix uh, politics and, and science, academia, and health economy, and civil society, we have to mix young and old. Everybody has to contribute. But the young people, of course, are the future, and they have to come and join us and kind of carry the torch with, it, with us. There are several programs which uh, have been present here and which uh, are part of uh, kind of uh, our ongoing uh, support. And that is, uh, if I talk of one group, which is an uh, institutional part of the M8 Alliance of uh, Academic Health Centers, Universities, and National Academies, that is the Young Physician Leader Program. It's a program where uh, all national academies around the world, about 130, 137 national academies, can propose young physician leaders. They are selected, very strong selection process, and then 20 are being invited. They get a coaching uh, course before the meeting, and then they are uh, invited to join uh, the meeting, and this will be ongoing, and we just have secured the funds that this will be a stable program in the future. You may or you may not know that uh, many academies have established a young academy. And uh, they have an organization called the Global Young Academy, and that is a new movement. Uh, some of us are members of the national academies, but you can see the age in general is 60 and above, because you need to have kind of established your career before, before you're elected to an academy. But we need the young academies to kind of infuse fresh blood. And that is another program. And then, of course, we have the Young Voices, supported by the Lancet and many other activities for young people. So this is something which we feel is a very strong recommendation. We go on, and that is, uh, that is important. Leadership uh, needs to be trained, and education and leadership kind of is one track, and uh, educated people will have to take on leadership if they take on responsibility. So this is the uh, first point. Education and leadership needs to be supported in the area of health as in other areas, of course. Second is research and innovation. If we have educated people, if we have people aspiring for leadership, they need structures to work in. And the uh, member of the uh, M8 Alliance, the uh, Inter-Academy Medical Panel, and that is about 70 academies which either have a medical section or uh, academies of medical sciences, like in Russia or like in, in, in uh, China, <clears throat> they have uh, discussed and presented a paper on uh, research capacity building in low and middle income countries. We feel that it is not possible in the long run to kind of uh, develop ideas in rich countries, uh, even fund programs in rich countries, and then they are kind of exported into low and middle income countries and regions. And uh, if there's no infrastructure to support that, then this will not be sustainable. So this is one of the major thrusts which we feel is necessary in the future to build up a infrastructure to prevent brain drains that young people who are well trained find a place where governance and situations and financial uh, contributions are such that they can find locally a place to work and to, to support programs which they develop or which they 
uh, embrace from uh, suggestions from outside. Trick number three and suggestion number three is uh, evidence to policy. Of course, this is uh, true to many, many areas in the, in, the, in, the, in the world of health. And there are three major topics which uh, we feel uh, need to be supported and, and stressed and emphasized. And one is uh, the uh, belief that we at the World Health Summit really have to go from basic science, from progress in basic science, to health, which is much more than medicine and, and research. It's, uh, as we have discussed, uh, social determinants, environment, and so many other things, and governance. The big revolution in basic science, of course, is genomics. There were several symposia on that. And it's not just genomics, it's proteomics, it's metabolomics, it's microbiomics, and many other omics. These have to be translated into practical medicine, into health programs. That's a major challenge. And uh, we feel that this needs to be uh, stressed and, and uh, uh, going beyond personalized medicine, going into stratified medicine and populations which are susceptible, susceptible or not, are, are, are sensitive to certain interventions, drug treatments, and so on. And along with this type of scientific development, it's big data. Big data is not just, and there was a major symposium on that with a keynote, big data is not just collection of data and making use of the vast amount of data in basic research and in, in health research uh, in the various uh, areas, but it's a new kind of uh, methodology to use these data to get, uh, come to grips with the protection of data, and this is a very important topic, I don't have to explain that, uh, and make best use of these data with respect to information technologies, with respect to data protection, and then application to medicine, stratified medicine, and health. This is uh, one of the... Uh, points we would like to emphasize as a result of this meeting. Third point in the area of evidence and policy is antibiotic resistance. You've all heard about that. There has been a symposium on antibiotic resistance. The bad use, the most widely used and, and sometimes not well structured use of antibiotics result in uh, problems which uh, need to be uh, considered and encountered. And there is a statement in preparation by the Interacademy Medical Panel and as a, for the first time together with the Interacademy Panel, which is a separate body of uh, all learned societies. And they are going to meet in Canberra, Australia in the beginning of November and they will hopefully and possibly, probably uh, sign a paper which has been discussed here and which will be important to tackle this problem. Number four is global health and development, a topic which has been discussed. Uh, there is no development in any country if the population is not healthy. There are infectious diseases, and we all know about this, HIV and tuberculosis and malaria. There are new diseases coming up, and these are the non-communicable diseases, largely discussed, like diabetes, obesity, metabolic disorders, uh, uh, mental health, and uh, this will be a high priority and will, be, will have to pursue it. It's a long-term uh, project, of course. This will not be tackled from one meeting to the other. Universal health coverage. We have been very proud to hear that the uh, certain governments, for the first time the German government, with an engagement to, uh, uh, to, to kind of expand to um, increase international activities, promote universal health coverage. That's a problem well known to all of you. The uh, M8 Alliance has started five years ago in Berlin as an annual meeting in October, and this is the fifth. But we have uh, developed a scheme of going to regional meetings. Everything is global, but certain regions have specific problems. And the first major, if I may say so, regional meeting was organized by President 
John Wong in Singapore, and this was an example which he said and his colleagues said, the regional aspects, which of course are all of interested, interesting for all of us who are interested in global health, but these specific topics we don't know as well as we would can learn them if such a regional meeting is, is being organized. This was a wonderful example. This is going to be continued. And the next meeting, and we'll hear about it, will be in Sao Paulo, with an emphasis on South American countries, of course. And there was one specific aspect which we would like to stress. In addition to regions of the world, Asia, Pacific region, or, or South America, there are certain regions in crisis. And such a region in crisis is the so-called MENA region, Middle Eastern, North African region. You uh, see the newspapers and the headline on, on Syria and what's going on in Egypt and other, other countries. We have to take care of that also, and we cannot stay kind of in the academic context. So we have produced a paper <coughs> coming out of the workshop where the uh, uh, organizations which participated in, already are participating in, uh, in the uh, um, well, uh, improvement of, of the situation and political activities and, 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 and try to, to, uh, to help the suffering countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, and, and Egypt to suffer from the massive influx of, uh, of refugees. We heard the Minister of Health from, from Jordan. Jordan, a country of 6 million people and 1.5 million refugees coming from Syria. That's something one country cannot cope with. So the uh, uh, donor communities, UN agencies, World Bank uh, participated in this meeting and they made a statement which we will publish as an annex to this uh, M8 statement asking for uh, substantial help and increased attention to the health problems in these areas and, and, and support the nations who are suffering so much from it. This will all be on the net and you can use this M8 Alliance statement for your own purposes, of course, and we will send it to all those who are interested or should be interested. I may mention that uh, this M8 Alliance is uh, developing as a real efficient group of dedicated organizations, medical centers, universities, and national academies. The national academies, as you know, have the... Uh, the raison d'etre actually is to counsel their national governments and they have access to the international organizations. So we feel that this M8 statement can have an effect, but it's only, of course, through your hard work and I want to thank you for this and also for, thank you for your attendance of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Detlev. And our next speaker is going to look forward to Sao Paulo, and it's our great pleasure to welcome Jose Otavio Aula, who is the Vice Dean at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Jose. Dear colleagues from the podium, distinguished audience, it's a privilege for me in this, this moment to present the, the regional meeting in Sao Paulo. It is an enormous responsibility for us to take into account, but you try to do, that, to do this meeting the best way that I can. So, the regional meeting, as Professor Gantin said, pretend to involve the countries of Latin America, and uh, you are preparing a meeting, of course, with general contents, but try to involve subjects of the world interest and also interest from your countries related to our countries. I will try to move this. Okay. Uh, as you see in this picture, Latin America 
has also 19 countries, and Brazil is one of them. There is a big continent, half a billion of inhabitants, and Brazil represents almost one third, a little bit more, of the inhabitants of the Latin America. Different from our neighbors that speak Spanish, we speak Portuguese. So, if you observe the, the, the map of Brazil, you can see a huge country, and uh, in the north of the country, you call Amazon forest or Amazon region, most of them is covered by tropical forest, rainforests. And the population is more concentrated along the coast, Atlantic coast, and in the east and south region of the country. So, <clears throat> you have a, a country with low de population density in the north and the west, and the, the, the major part of the population is concentrated in some regions. That, that <clears throat> explain that among the 20 big cities in the world, Brazil has two, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And to provide health care, nice transportation, air quality of the air, infrastructure, and the health accessibility is a challenge for all governments. Of course, the role of the academy aside to to graduate students and so on, is to collaborate with research and scientific opinions about the program and about the, the policymakers of the country. Uh, focus, focusing in the state of Sao Paulo is not the biggest in the area, but it's the bigger and the biggest in the population State of Sao Paulo has 44 million of inhabitants. Part or half is concentrated in a large area of Sao Paulo capital, around Sao Paulo capital. So we can imagine 20 million of people living uh, in, a, in the same region. And, uh, but Sao Paulo also represents the, the states more technical or on the technology and the industries is so have so aside <clears throat> to have a like a great part of the GDP of the country is also have problems of pollution and so on because these industries concentrate in this uh, in your state and uh, you have also. Uh, important universities in the state of Sao Paulo, three public state universities, one federal state university, and several private universities that represent almost, almost 40% uh, of the places offered to the students in the country. The sponsor or the main sponsor or the organizer, the main organizer of this regional meeting will be our school, School of Medicine, that belongs to the University of Sao Paulo, one of the three universities, public universities, state public universities of our state. This is a very old school, not compared to the age of the Europe, but considering Brazil, it was founded in 1912, so last year, we were celebrating 100 years. And the School of Medicine <coughs> is also a very, <coughs> has a nice reputation in the country, mainly because the research and the number of patients that you, has, that you have under our responsibility in your hospital around the, our school. Uh, aside of uh, the main organizer, we have partners, of course, Emirate Alliance. 
e Minister of Health, Secretary of Health, FAPESP is a foundation that supports research in the state of Sao Paulo, National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, Brazil Academy of Science, Sao Paulo Academy of Science, and the Faculty of Medicine Foundation that supports our school and your hospital. Uh, this is a, a view, a view of uh, the place that are pretend to organize the, the symposium. The symposium, you can see uh, the, the yellow, the red star represents the convention center. The medical school, a blue star, and the school of public health that belongs to the same university but is road separated. It's, an, it's a very near, uh, all of them are very near. So inside this campus, we can walk in short distance, moving in, around it, that. Including the hotels, I will show that uh, later, is in a quite a distance, a walking distance. One of the problems of Sao Paulo is the traffic, it's so jammed. So it's necessary to, to, to put the, poop, the people near to facilitate the, <coughs> the transportation. So this is a map of the meeting zone. You can also observe the convention center, the school of medicine, the hotels, and they are served by subway next to the school. Just in front of us, there is a station of subway and the subway in Sao Paulo uh, connects important regions of the city. You have a lot of facilities to, to accommodate a, a regional meeting like that. You are expecting almost 1,000 participants from Latin America, from Asia, from Europe, from US, from Canada. And uh, <coughs> Excuse me. You have a convention center with 860 places, two auditorium, and small conference rooms, a theater inside the campus, the School of Medicine, and several auditoriums, all served with free Wi Fi. This is a view <coughs> of your convention center called. Centro de Convenções Rebouças in Portuguese. This is uh, 100 meters, or no more than to our school, so it belongs to the campus. This is a theater inside of a school of medicine. Some views of the auditorium. And I will present some outline of the meeting. This timeline was uh, <clears throat> organized together with KIT and some data. My presentation is in a website, so if you want, you can consult the data just to follow the, the time. But uh, our intention is to have uh, almost read, including the speaker's invitation, by November. 30. Uh, we organize also some, some, some symposiums. In uh, Friday afternoon, you are discussing medical education, a satellite symposium in your school afternoon. You are in a, in a movement to restructure your curriculum. So it will be a very nice discussion. Our students now are more, even more, uh, worried about social conditions, about global problems. So it's necessary to have a profound reflection about that. There is also an administrative meeting in the School of Medicine with the AMU Alliance, including a uh, uh, I encounter a meeting of uh, deans of public schools. 
This is, is, is organized by the School of Meds, school, public school for USP, and by John Hopkins, trying to put together deans of different parts of the world, mainly from Latin America. And the symposium will be organized from 2 to 6 in Sunday. You are organizing an opening ceremony in the government palace. And the symposium during the seventh and eighth days in the convention center. There is some the, the principal program tracks and the title of the programs. Uh, number one is health life expectancy, urban health, and violence in mega cities. Increase research capacity to incorporate technologies, health education and management of health systems to ensure universal coverage. It's very important, this discussion, because the costs of the health is increasing progressively. It's a very important, this kind of discussion, and to, to, to discuss the experience of some countries. The tracks will be organizing in workshops, symposiums, lectures. I will not describe eating by eating, as I mentioned before, all of these are in the, <clears throat> in the website. You can observe the, the, the program. And the, at the end of the month, probably the November, these tracks will almost be read, including with the speakers. This is the this, this symposium of health and violence in mega cities. And part of them are organized by some persons that I have already discussed. Management of health systems to ensure universal coverage and increase research capacity to incorporate technologies. And finally, a symposium of health education and some, some speakers, like uh, Professor Martin Tor from Mexico, are mostly confirmed. You will also discuss with Lancet about poster submission. Um, it's our intention to emphasize the poster presentation and to stimulate people to, to submit and to have a special moment during the, the symposium to discuss the poster and including to award the best five posters. Kit Group from German is also collaborating with the World Summit Regional Meeting in Sao Paulo, including website, abstract submission, registration announcements, session planner, and participation booklet. Finally, we booked 120 rooms nearby for the official Alliance delegation speakers. And uh, we offer <coughs> by a uh, uh, select agents to all their participants to facilitate the, the accommodation. Flight is including, you are contracting a, or a private company to, to offer the, the best flights, the, the best routes, including package of tourist options for that they want to stay a little bit more time in Brazil or in Sao Paulo. Information contact could be directly to me or Professor Krieger or the, our international relations office and receive suggestions and comments and any doubts that we can respond. Thank you so much for attention. Okay, so now we're going to have um, some discussion with our panel. And uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to get it off to a um, possibly unusual start. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to come to the World Health Summit for the past uh, five years. And I was able to attend the S Singapore meeting uh, earlier this year. Uh, and for the past three years, um, because the meeting has always fallen at half term, uh, I've brought my daughter with me, um, who's now 12 years old. 
And over dinner last night, I asked her, her name's Isabel, um, I asked her, well, what did you think of the World Health Summit? She's one of the youth delegation, maybe the youngest member um, of the unofficial youth delegation coming to uh, Berlin. And um, she then gave me a little speech, uh, which I hurriedly scribbled down. And I want to just read you what she said. Remember, she's 12 years old, and, and, so, and she's my harshest critic, um, so she's a little blunt. But let me, let me read you what she said anyway. And there's a question for the panel that comes at the end. So, it's a sweet thing, the World Health Summit. I think the World Health Summit is a very good idea. But I think your words need to be put into actions. I've watched you for three years, but I have seen no outcome. I haven't heard of the World Health Summit on the news or anywhere else. In this symposium, I hear you all talking about what you can do and about what the World Health Summit is. But nothing ever seems to get done. Even though I'm an outsider, and perhaps I'm a bit naive on the subject, I can still easily see that so far, the World Health Summit has hardly any impact on global health. But I think with a little bit of effort, and maybe some hard work, you could change many people's lives. So, panel, What effort, what hard work do we need to put in to make five years of the World Health Summit change people's lives? Professor Ganton, I'm coming to you first. I was afraid you were asking me that. Um, <clears throat> let me first say I know Isabel uh, Horton. She's a wonderful young lady, and uh, I think what she says is... Uh, fresh, but uh, also, you know, old guys like Eduard and myself, um, we agree, um, in some sense. <laughs> uh, there's not enough action, and I'm, uh, I can kind of cite my wife, you know. <laughs> what are you doing all the time? I mean, is World Health Summit really, uh, World Health really improving? And I'm saying, well, we are developing strategies. And my wife hates the word strategy. <laughs> you know, always talking about strategies at home and <laughs> in meetings. But uh, to the serious side of the matter, um, the first thing we can do is, I think, get people together who usually don't get together. And we would have uh, not continued doing the World Trade Summit if the feedback would have been Forget about it, it's useless exercise, Ever, somebody else does it better. Then we would have, all of us would have other things to do. There is no meeting I know of, WHO is a wonderful partner, of course, extremely important, World Health Assembly and everything they do in the regional offices, but having academia, with the freedom of academia, getting people from the health economy, pharmaceutical industry, medical technology, IT technology, um, politics at uh, the various levels. I mean, at the ceremony, you have the, seen some of the highest levels, but there are politics at all levels, health and all polities. Coming here, taking time out for two days or three days, listening to people in genomics and, and metabolomics and so on, regenerative medicine. This forum does not exist. So this is a purpose in itself. And I hope people learn and as I mentioned, the uh, kind of the uh, exercise and the recommendations of the, uh, of the M8 Alliance, and I, I take that serious, and all my colleagues take it serious, education, education, education. I mean, uh, just medicine is not helping, and bringing access to medicine is one important part, but it's not all. And education of the leaders, old leaders, young leaders, Eduardo and myself, you are among, if I may say so, <laughs> Uh, the elderly part of the group, uh, <clears throat> we are learning every day. And we are teaching it to uh, you know, those who want to listen. So this is the first answer. And Isabel, I know, she's very intelligent. She talks to you. <laughs> so you learn from her and she learns from you. Okay? Yeah. So all generations. 
And that's not, not little. That's, yeah. that's a lot. That's a lot. Are we doing something real? Are we changing the world? I give you one example. I'm not overestimating what we are doing. But um, the Copenhagen meeting, somebody mentioned that in the ceremony on climate change, was a disaster because the climate people were among themselves. They did not agree, and then they went. <laughs> you know that, and Lancet has reported on that. Okay, so the national academies were sitting together. The Interacademy Medical Panel was preparing actually its first major paper, at least I was participating in, on climate change and health. And this paper was brought to the attention of all national governments, and that is how many, about 180 national governments, it's the United Nations, it's WHO, it's UNESCO, and they read this two-page paper, short paper, like our M8 statement, short paper, climate change and health, and after Copenhagen there was no climate meeting without health being included. So this is one example. And of course, uh, these are, this is strategy, and this is kind of influencing, using our influence on those who can then uh, develop the topic further. But this is, uh, I could give you some more examples, but it's one example that indeed, we achieve something, not as much as we would like, and not as fast as we would have, but uh, it's not in vain, I hope. No, abs absolutely, and, um, and I think also, as, as you said uh, at an earlier meeting this week, that the influence on the German government in developing its strategy for health and development, this meeting has had an important framing role in helping that um, process take place. John, I want to turn to you because I think it's a common consent amongst everybody that I've heard, and I certainly felt this myself, that the Singapore meeting was a supreme success and allowed people to come together um, to, in a sense, not just celebrate the innovations in health systems reforms, but to use the meeting as a crucible to share experiences and the common challenges that people face. Can you just give us a little sense of of the, the successes and outcomes of the Singapore meeting and what you think more we could do to encourage those successes? Well, uh, thank you, Richard. Um, uh, I think the first point that uh, uh, I think myself and my colleagues in Singapore would like to share is that um, when you see a good idea, shamelessly see how you can adopt it, see how you can build on it, and see how it can ampli be amplified. And um, I was very privileged that uh, Detlev invited me to take part in the first World Health Summit. And I was struck uh, by the fact that this was a meeting in 2009 where I met incredible academics. There were Nobel laureates there. Um, uh, there were deans of universities. There were also policy makers there. There were uh, ministers, um, there were uh, senior civil servants. There was industry there, there was the CEOs, there were CEOs of companies, um, people in charge, senior vice presidents of drug development. There was the media there, uh, both the scientific media, and I had the great pleasure of getting to know you and The Lancet better, um, but also um, the mass media. And then there was civic society there. Um, there was civic society represented by NGOs, as well as bodies such as the WHO and the World Bank. And it did strike me that um, this was a very unusual meeting, that people would be willing to take two to three days off from schedules, which we all know are terribly overcommitted, um, to try and learn from each other. And there were things that I personally learned. Um, in Singapore, I've when I went back, I did share uh, data that Hopkins had presented at the first meeting on the power of integrated care in looking after patients with chronic multi-morbidity illnesses. Uh, and that was back in 2009, and uh, well, certainly it's, uh, it's at least helped shape some of the things that we're trying to do in Singapore. Um, so that was, Singapore has basically said, well, um, we thought that this concept of the World Health Summit was wonderful, but Europe is a little bit far for some people. So can we bring the concepts of the World Health Summit to our part of the world? 
and um, the M8 Alliance was extremely supportive. Of course, uh, Detlev's uh, moral authority is supreme, uh, and to have the support of uh, um, uh, Detlev uh, uh, and the Charité and the rest of the M8 Alliance, which was extremely supportive, um, uh, we actually went ahead um, and uh, proposed uh, a, a, a meeting in Asia. Now, there are probably two key ingredients uh, I learned, uh, and, and, um, uh, which I think were crucial. Well, I'm glad that people enjoyed the Singapore meeting. The first is it is critical to involve policymakers. And my, I've got colleagues from the Ministry of Health here uh, in, in the audience. Dr. Lynn James is sitting there. And Lynn was one of the co-chairs uh, um, uh, with myself and Dr. Derek Heng. So it was uh, essentially, it was co-chaired between the Ministry of Health and the National University of Singapore. Mm. So that, to me, was critical lesson number one, that if you want to try and translate something, you need to get as many people interested in the same idea. And so the fact that the Ministry of Health was so supportive, uh, actually, to me, was uh, without it, could not have happened. The second equally important component was that we had a multidisciplinary scientific committee. So the scientific committee, the co-chairs, one of them is here, uh, Professor Chong Yap Singh. He's an obstetrician and gynecologist. And the other, co the other member of the scientific uh, chairperson, I think many people in the audience know, was Professor Tiki Pang, who is in the School of Public Policy. So we had a scientific committee shaped by the, sc by the schools of medicine, School of Public Policy, as well as the School of Public Health, as well as the business school. Hmm. So you've got a business school, because business schools really understand at the end of the day that health is critical for the successful running of an economy. Public policy schools, well, actually, they're the ones who implement the, the they do the ultimate translation. You can do the best science, but if someone in, in, in public policy doesn't affect it, it's not going to get anywhere. And then the combination of the medical schools and the schools of public health. And in Singapore, we had uh, three medical schools involved. We had the NUS School of Medicine, we had the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School, and then we had a former past president, Stephen Smith, who was at Nanyang Technological University. Three schools involved, so it was truly a multi-institutional effort. So I think those were two, you know, two critical ingredients. And I just want to share with the audience the so what factor coming out of the Singapore meeting. Uh, that was only six months ago, by the way. but. Um, we had one Minister of Health, um, who I was struck, spent the whole two days uh, sitting at the meeting taking copious notes. And because he stayed, you know, when the Minister stays, the delegation stays also. <clears throat> and we had one Director General of Health also sit there for the f two days and take copious notes. And both of them wrote very nice letters saying that they, in two days, they could hear topics that they would have to probably patched together in the course of several months. So it was an intense two-day ability to absorb information from multiple sources. Um, in the industry leaders section, um, we had one of Indonesia's uh, leading pharmaceutical companies, Dexa Medica, present what they were doing. And in fact, Dexa Medica presented in Berlin. And um, people were struck that there, is a, there are pharmaceutical companies in Asia which are doing world-class uh, um, uh, R&D. Um, we had uh, uh, Professor Suet present today, but he first presented in um, uh, Singapore about Thailand's plans to implement universal health coverage that was affordable and sustainable, and that they did not really have to break the bank in trying to adopt universal health coverage by actually trying to look at very specific issues that Thailand face. So while universal health coverage is a great concept, it does need to be contextualized. And how they contextualized was very effective. And then there were examples. Uh, um, there was a symposium on, on how S Singapore provides safe water. Singapore was not self-sufficient in water until just a few years ago but it was truly a multi-agency effort, not really led by the Ministry of Health. It was led by the Ministry of Environment and, of course, health, education, and everything else. There was the, um, um, the typhoid kit, the diagnostic kit developed by Hong Kong. Uh, I think people weren't aware about that, those innovations. So it was a one way of trying to 
of what I call setting up the, 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 the framing the agenda. And I'm very pleased to announce, so at least share with you, that one of the, at least one of the symposia that I know of, actually there were two symposia that I know of, but one of the symposia actually said, hey, this was a really good discussion we had, let's continue that discussion. So this was the whole discussion about how to make medicine affordable, because you can't have universal health coverage if medicine is not affordable. So that, set, that symposium was a symposium organized by the National University of Singapore and Harvard University. Um, they uh, convened a meeting on October 2nd, six months later. 15 countries turned up, including WHO's Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions. 56 senior policy makers came for a two-day meeting because they wanted to continue that discussion behind closed doors. And the nice thing about having a discussion organized so-called in a university environment is that everyone remembers what they were like when they were university students. <laughs> you know, we were less inhibited, we were more carefree, we had less hang-ups. Um, and um, well, the World Health, uh, besides WHO, the World Bank was there, um, the German Development Corporation was there, uh, and they, in the, in the space of two days, they, let, they came to very useful conclusions on how to bring the agenda forward for affordable medicine. So yes, I think we do face many challenges at a meeting like this, where there is a lot of talk. But actually, I was very heartened that there was congruence on several issues. And I probably have three take-home items. Well, three plus one. Let me tell you about the three that I take home. Number one, we heard at the beginning of this World Health Summit and today, the last day, that we are all metaphorically a global ship. On the first day, we heard that this is a traditional ship, we're on the sea, we're all in our cabins, but there's no one at the steering wheel. So how do we come out of our cabins? That was on day one. Today, on the last day, we heard from Ann Glover about the metaphorical spaceship. How are we going to go to Mars? We need to make trade-offs. Because, yes, if we want to do one thing, well, do we have enough fuel to get there? So how do we work collectively in trade-offs for a common good? So that is, a platform like this is where we all get together and we agree on what trade-offs we need to make. The second take-home lesson, again, is the tremendous tragedy that good science doesn't equal good health. And there are several things that we need to do. We need to tackle the social determinants of health. My biggest weakness is that I don't have a good, I don't have a good found, uh, grounding in behavioral science and social sciences. How do I make up for that deficit? So therefore, how do we get the right workforce? We've got the young leaders here. We really do need to have the right workforce with the right training, and that's the whole issue of what Detlef has said, education, education, education. Then we need better and more effective translation, and that's the role of the media. The Lancet, all the medical journals, and the, and the lay media, we need your help in translating that message so that it's understood by the person in the street. I think there was a 2007 paper written, written by Schroeder et al., which said that actually, if you look at preventable, if you look at premature death, only 10% of premature death is really affected by good science. 40%, 4-0, is affected by behavioral sciences. So, you know, I think uh, uh, we can spend all our time in the lab, but unless we change behavior, we're not going to really impact a big chunk of health. And then we also heard about the need for better health systems. We just cannot afford to run health systems that bleed 10 to 20 percent in terms of wastage. And the last, the third message, that there is hope on the horizon. We saw the advances in, 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 the, in framing what are the questions that need to be answered for universal health, the answers that we need to address for genomic medicine, the answers we need for big data, and the fact that we're all sitting in the German Ministry of Health, the importance of diplomacy. So I said there were three plus one factors I learned. Those were the three. The plus one is I've learned that Isabel's gene is an autosomal dominant gene from the father. Thank <laughs> right. you very much. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. <laughs> 
that very nicely summarizes, I think, the lessons and successes of the Singapore meeting. Now I'd like to turn um, to our colleagues from Brazil, and I don't want to talk about the mechanics of the meeting. Um, now I want to focus on, on one of the very special lessons that John pointed out was the specificity that Singapore succeeded because it focused upon this particular challenge of countries in the region. And that's what made so much of the presentations and shared knowledge there so valuable, that people really did have tangible material evidence to take away and think about and translate into action. So I'd like both of you, if you could, to set out what you see as the major challenges, not just for Brazil, but for the region of Latin America. Um, and maybe, Yabas, if I could come to you first for that. Okay, uh, thank you. I think that uh, Latin America has some very common, despite the difference uh, among the countries, some very common features uh, and their impact on the health sector, I think that are also uh, very common. The Latin America was the, Latin, the Americas, but including Latin America, uh, was the, the first region to eliminate polio, measles, rubella, for example. So there is a, a strong history of public health victories in the region. But at the same time, the social inequalities among these countries are so uh, huge sometimes that you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot have universal uh, health coverage, for example, if you don't uh, if you don't implement some specific strategies to overcome the social barriers and to reach the most vulnerable people. So I think the forum, if we, and, and I, 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 I wrote the word from, from Isabella, that it's important to have a lot of talk to, to talk about what we should do, uh, what is the, 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 the borders of the knowledge in public health and also in medicine, training, and so on, but also share the experience, how and what we did uh, to ensure that the poor communities in the Amazon region, for example, have access using new technologies, telemedicine, but also uh, with the guarantee that they will have access to tools strategies that are already available. So I think that this is the, I think the most interesting thing that I, in my opinion, we will have in the, in the regional forum. Thanks very much, Elvis. And um, Jose, for you, um, priorities in terms of the region that we would like the meeting in Sao Paulo to address? I would say that the problems of the big cities, mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a nice term, a nice, a nice subject, including violence, including alcohol and drugs abuse, including sanitation, including uh, accessibility to the system. Mm. As Sharbas mentioned, mm. it's maybe more easily to get information by internet or by teleconference to a very far distance uh, to, the pa to one patient comes from the periphery of the big city. There is a lot of big cities in Latin America to a specialized center. Mm -hmm. So I think this discussion together with policymakers together with media, producing documents, I think it will be very important. I think it's for to sit down, policymakers from Latin America, academia, together with specialized media, as John mentioned, mass media. I think it will be produce a very strong movement. You are in a, you are in a very hard discussion in Brazil right now about our model mm. of the accessibility. This is a very discussion. The government says primary care will be the model. <clears throat> this is, is not a common model for us. I don't know all Latin America. I guess there is no uh, organized service in your, in your countries like that. So, 
But to design a more successful model for this from Canada, for other countries, maybe it could be very important <clears throat> to teach it, to, to people learn about that. It's my opinion. Very good, thank you. And Eduardo, I'd like to ask you, because you're past president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the World Health Summit, the whole idea of the World Health Summit is to stand up very strongly for science as a social force. What is, briefly, what's the state of science um, support and funding in Brazil and as far as you can say across the region? In good shape or needs more, more commitment from political leaders? No, we need, we need to progress in science. Uh, you know, Latin America and Brazil were very late in science. Actually, in Brazil, uh, we have regular science only in the last 40 years, maybe. You can have some figures in, in the 70s where we have no regular official PhD program like we have now. Uh, in the 80s, we were graduating 800 PhD per year. Last year, we graduated 12,000. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, we were, we were publishing 3,000 international papers per year. Last, uh, last year, we published 35,000. So we are captain now. Mm -hmm. We are really very in, in support of the government for fellowships, for the graduate uh, programs. We have uh, financial support, federal, and in Sao Paulo we have a state foundation also. So we are, I believe in Brazil, uh, in the last uh, few decades, uh, doing well in science. Our big challenge is how to use this science for development, social and economical de development. This is our biggest challenge and no, nobody teach. It's easier to make international collaboration in science. It's, what, it's not easy to make in technology, in transference of knowledge in, in technology or, or development, you know? So this is up to now, up to each country to use <laughs> knowledge to, to transfer, to, 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 to develop. So for us, this is the, the, the big challenge, yeah. But Fantastic. Now I'd like to come to the audience. Um, we've got um, some minutes for questions and I think you've had set out very nicely what the agenda is for a meeting like this and what its successes and challenges are. Please come to the microphones and um, offer your questions to the panel. Um, and if you don't, then I'll pick on you. Um, yes, please. Come, just come to the microphones. Don't wait for me to um, pick you up. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bernard. My name is Bernard Apia. I am from Ghana, and I happen to be a science journalist. I, I really like uh, the World Health Summit. Uh, I mean, this is my first, and I have really enjoyed it. I mean, meeting a student in particular, because I realized that you know, students are future leaders. Um, my little concern, though, is that it seems to me that uh, even though uh, we are I mean, hoping to collaborate with and, with different sectors or professionals in the future to address some global health issues, we seem to have neglected some other groups of people that may also help advance our goal. For instance, we, have, we do have medical students here um, as an association. We have nursing students and then pharmacy students and some political science students elsewhere who may eventually also help address this problem, but that groups of students are not here. And I'm thinking that if we should you know, continue to do that, then in future, the people who get more experience here may find it difficult collaborating with people who they are already not collaborating with. So I'm thinking that in future, we should consider inviting some international student organizations, political science, pharmacy, nursing, you know, social, I think that may also help address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Let me take several comments from the audience. Who'd like to follow up with a comment or a question? Anybody like to follow up? So you, yes, please, 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 please. 
Just a small question. Um, just say for everybody so they so, know who you are. Sorry, my name is Sudeh Sani. I'm a scientist from Pasteur Institute. Uh, my question is, why are there no NGOs represented, um, such as um, I could now think about MSF, Epicentre, these are the ones that I know, but there are many, many more. GARP, WARN, um, working on anti-malaria resistance, working on antibiotic resistance. Um, well, React was, was, was there, but um, we didn't have any representative of NGOs in the sessions. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else like to take a chance at the microphone? Yes, go on. Hello, my name is Jonas Albert. I'm from Germany. I'm a student in the master's program. Just a short question. What would you and I mean, the whole panel think about making the World Health Summit in general a little bit more of a stage for potentially disruptive innovation in healthcare and in global health? Right, we need a bit more disruption. Um, let, me, let me come to the panel very quickly on these first two points. I think the, the first two questions are linked. Your, all of you emphasized the value of this meeting as a convening point for lots of different sectors, uh, lots of different communities. But maybe not all of those communities get an equal voice on the stage and on panels. And so it's no good having them in the audience if they're not also involved in the actual discussion that takes place. Reflections on that, it's, it seems a pretty good point to me that we need to get, if we're talking about young voices, why aren't they up here? If we're talking about NGOs, why aren't they up here? Comments? I think, yes. it, I think I'll consider the student's voice, the new voice. Mm. I think it's very important. The presence of students, I think, is, is, is very much important. The formation of the new leaders. So the presence of students or for international organization is also very welcome, It's my opinion. So on the um, Sao Paulo program, we can see, we'll see a yes. strong presence of students and yeah. NGOs you as well. You can open the website and the people can... Very like good. It. So note that. Come to okay. Sao Paulo yeah. and make sure that Jose's words are translated okay. into action. That's very good. Detlef. Well, just to, I mean, there's no misunderstanding. We want everybody to participate actively, NGOs, students, different kinds of students from various disciplines. But your question shows the difficulty. I mean, we have uh, two days and a half. We could easily go on for five days or longer and give everybody a voice. Um, uh, it's a question of programming and, and, and so on. But of course, you know, some groups could be more prominent than others. But this shows and gives me an opportunity, my feeling. I mean, I'm a you know, classical conservative medical doctor. <laughs> and <clears throat> the health area is so diverse and so fragmented. And actually, the fact that you are asking for the various groups to be present, it's not everybody in health, like everybody's in the automobile industry or the IT industry or something else, which are as diverse, but they are one industry, one group. We, the health group, is from the conservative doctors to the uh, uh, progressive uh, NGOs and, and uh, other organizations, and it's worlds separating them. We want to bring them together. The experience we had the very first time was actually very massive, and some of you may have uh, witnessed that massive intervention. What kind of conservative World Trade Summit is going to take place there in 2009? They're all invited. They all came. Actually, they made a counter summit, and we went to the summit. We invited them over. So uh, if there's anybody who feels left out, please come up front. Tell us. You're all clearly invited. Our goal is to create one health community, okay? Not separated by uh, ideologies or profession or whatever. And we are a long way to go. And your question is testi t testimony to that. Very good, very good, excellent. Yes, please. I come from REACT, Action on Antibiotic Resistance. I work in Sweden, but I am Colombian. I would like to put as a, as a theme for the World Health Summit in Sao Paulo, maybe the effect of trade agreements in access to medicine and healthcare at all, in, at large. Mm, very good. Good. That's a, that's a parallel session that's gone down. I know, Jose, you've, you've written that down, haven't you? Parallel session. Very good. On trade agreements. Um, what about this question of disruptive... Good. Excellent. 
Um, disruptive innovation. I mean, that's a very important thing. I, I turn to John here because I think, again, we saw some of that in Singapore, didn't yes. we? Um, so I, I fully uh, agree with all the comments that have been being, that, you know that have been made. And just to share, for the Singapore meeting, we had 130 students uh, from medicine, nursing, business school, uh, and uh, public health. Um, uh, but um, uh, in terms of disruptive innovation, I think the one challenge with disruptive innovation is that, especially in a meeting like this, is that you do need to have preliminary data. Yeah, so we do need people to have pilot data to at least show that, um, that, that at least that it's not purely hypothesis generation, generating. Otherwise, you're going to have Richard Horton come after you and say, so what? Um, so um, I think that that's one issue. And I did see uh, uh, evidence of that. I mean, there were two, just off the top of my head, I thought that David DeCresta's presentation on Andrology Australia was, uh, and the way that they're tackling uh, the whole issue of uh, um, uh, using a biomarker, i.e. sexual health in men, as a biomarker for screening for cardiovascular, uh, and di cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, so, you know, screening comes in many ways. Uh, if you approach it from a sexual health viewpoint, it has impact amongst half the world's population. Um, I, saw, I saw glimpses of disruptive innovation in the genomics uh, um, um, symposium uh, on the, because this whole issue about personalized, or personalized as well as stratified medicine using the human genome, that has the potential for disruptive technology, but the question is how do we apply this intelligently? Because people are terrified about the cost of, of implementing this, and so, therefore, we need to get some pilot data that maybe short-term investment may lead to long-term societal gain. So uh, I think that that's where disruptive technology comes in. Dada, very quickly, because I'm going to close <clears throat> in a second. We can learn a lot from history. The French Revolution came about by the, there are some French in the audience here, by the general assemblies which uh, gathered before. Rudolf Virchow, one of my hero, and certainly one of the heroes of some of the audience, was a revolutionary. He was fighting on the barricades in 1848 against the emperor. He was exiled to Bavaria, and then he was asked back. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm in favor of revolution and disruptive interventions and innovations and whatever. You will have to very carefully consider, if you start a revolution, whether you do more harm or good, and what the outcome of the revolution is. So, and that's why we do have this forum, okay? And if we come to a conclusion that a revolution in the area of health is needed, okay, that is our General Assembly. This would be the best result for Isabel, I hope, <laughs> and for his father, her father, and for, for many of us. But this needs preparation. And health is so complex, and the ramifications are so broad that this has to be carefully considered. So note that Professor Ganton, a self-declared revolutionary conservative. <laughs> Very good. That's what we like. That's what we like. You know, it, it was five or six years ago that I sat with Detlev here in Berlin to discuss the 300th anniversary of the Charité and his emerging ideas for the notion of what has become this World Health Summit. And although it began as an occasion to celebrate 300 years of the Charité, it also had a larger mission right from the start. And that larger mission was a sense that the European voice in global health had been too quiet, had been too silent, and it was a moment for that Europe European voice to assert itself with a vision and a positive view of where the world could go distinctive set of European values that should be present at the global table discussing so that we don't have, and I say this humbly myself as somebody from the United Kingdom, an Anglo-American hegemony in the way we discuss these issues. And I think the World Health Summit has succeeded very well in bringing that European voice to bear. But we've seen over the years 
the, the World Health Summit evolve in very positive ways. Um, it began also with this notion of the M8, now the M16, bringing the unique voice of academia, of science, again to the table of policymaking. And the announcement this week by Fred Binker of the World Federation uh, of Academic Institutions for Global Health is another signal of how these networks, these regional and global networks, are coming together to put science at the center of that kind of thinking. We've also seen the introduction of new voices, and that's very important. And that's our small contribution to this meeting, the new voices session that will take place at the end of this afternoon, thinking about future leaders, new generations of how to get this right. And immediately after this session, there's a young physician leaders uh, group meeting to discuss, and I would encourage you to go and see what that future is going to look like. But the most recent iteration of the World Health Summit is very important too, and that is the emergence of regional voices, not just Europe, but Asia and now Latin America. And when we think about countries and we think about the global level of discussion, often these regional experiences are not captured well. And I do think the World Health Summit can provide that unique place where regionalism can thrive. What does this meeting stand for? At its best, this meeting is about advocacy for science for social justice. It is about acting to deliver the right to the highest attainable standards of health. And it's about holding accountable all of us here and outside. We're in the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's about us holding accountable governments to ensure that their promises and commitments are delivered. Advocate, act, Hold accountable, that's what the World Health Summit stands for. Thank the panel.